In a world of limitless opportunities and countless challenges, the choices we make manifest themselves into the very roads that guide us. In the tribulations and triumphs that shape, weather and bind these paths together are the very essence of what makes the world such a beautifully strange place. But we walk our path with no map, in search of answers that nobody has, simply hoping that we don't get lost along the way. So maybe just sharing our story of where we come from and the things that have guided us along the way can be enough to guide those lost in their own path. I'm Zach Bonanza, and this is the Lost Guidance Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on the season two premiere of the Lost Guidance Podcast. Holy crap, we made it, folks. We're back. And today I'm joined by the lovely Candace Malone. Thank you for coming in. Of course. Happy to be here. Um, today we're going to be tackling an issue that uh, may not be suitable for every listener. It's something that I've uh, gone back and forth on even wanting to talk about, but I think it's something that's so prevalent and so pervasive in our society. It affects each one of us on a personal and global scale, and uh, I just think it needed to be talked about, and that's the uh, the drug epidemic, mostly focusing on uh, kind of the opioid side of things, and uh, Candace has been brave enough to come on and talk about her experiences, her kind of interdigitation with uh, this plague. And uh, just kind of the things that have affected her. And we're going to be just chatting about things that you can do to recognize signs, to, to communicate with family members and loved ones and things like that. So, uh, again, thank you for coming on. It's a beautiful day for a uh, not-so-beautiful topic. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to keep it light and breezy. Light and breezy. That's as what we shoot for. Possible. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, you know, it's it's easily determinable i mean anybody could tell you yeah we know we have a, a pretty big drug epidemic in the country um just to kind of solidify into people's brains i went on and i looked at the uh, new york state opioid annual report from 2018 and just kind of got some of the stats because although we know it's like i said pervasive in society we, sometimes you lose sight of how pervasive it is and, and the scale at which it's making itself prevalent you know so um looking at c some of their surveys and some of their details that they gave um you're looking at, you know, in 2016, uh, there was over 11,000 emergency visits, which doesn't sound like too many. Um, 6,000 of those being pertaining to heroin overdoses uh, and the remaining pertaining to opioid overdoses, I should say. Um, it might not sound like a lot, but when you're talking about per capita, that's like 57 out of 100,000, they state. So uh, it's opioid overdoses and just kind of this uh, opioid epidemic that we're seeing uh, Daggeringly grow, especially in this area, the Oneida County, the Central New York area. It just it hits home. Um, they go on to show statistics that uh, males are twice as likely to be uh, affected by this, um, and it's really prevalent throughout the eighteen to twenty or four year old uh, demographic. Uh, that's actually the highest demographic. About one hundred and five out of every hundred thousand eighteen to twenty four year olds is succumbing to this kind of um, malfeasance. You know, so uh, in two thousand seventeen, there was over. Uh, 8 million opioid prescriptions given. And so where we might think that uh, the medicinal route to get people off these things is a better avenue, we're seeing it, again, still so um, st still so prevalent in society that we're going to get into this, obviously, that perhaps it's not the best route to take. You know, there's uh, counteracting uh, one addiction for uh, prescription addiction, obviously, is something that we can't handle. Um, the death rates... We're, I mean, a lot of people are going to look at this and say, all right, well, you're, when you're factoring in New York City, obviously you're going to see these rates spike. Well, that's not true, actually. You're seeing the most pervasive amounts of death rates, of addictions, of overdoses happening in areas like the Niagara area, sure, the Long Island area, but then the Oneida County, Central New York area, um, to the point where uh, I believe it said, uh, so, so per populace, there was 50 deaths in the Oneida County area, like uh, Oneida, Madison, and all that. Um, and I think just in Oneida County, there's, they said there was 231,000 people, give or take, right? And uh, 50 deaths came out of that. So you're talking, um, let's see, 25.1 out of every 100,000 people, right? 25 people out of every 100,000. That's pretty staggering. Mm -hmm. You look at the New York City rates, just talking like the Manhattan, Queens area, 499 deaths for 8 million people. So you're looking at 5.5 out of every 100,000. So in our area, 25 out of 100,000. New York City, 5 out of 100,000. I mean that's a testament to something being wrong in our society and something being a little bit broken. So 
what we need to do is bring light to the subject and just talk about it and let people know uh, maybe if they're a little bit in the dark or maybe just kind of playing ignorant to the fact that maybe one of their loved ones is succumbing to this. It's good to bring it to their attention, bring it out loud and just say these things and let them recognize uh, the situation as it is. So, Candace, you obviously, as we had said before, have a deep seated, deep rooted um, and unfortunate connection to this epidemic and this plague that's kind of going through the area. So would you like to share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, go ahead and bring that mic just a little bit closer. Yep. Perfect. Uh, so my brother Danny mm -hmm. uh, passed away in March of 2017. He was 29 years old and uh, actually had injected for the first time in 11 months. Wow. So he had been sober for 11 months and the first injection just happened to be laced with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And so he passed away after two days on life support. Uh, and he had been battling the addiction for nine years. Yeah. So uh, there was a span in there where he was clean for three years, and you know your hopes get up, and you're right, of course. You know, uh, and he was doing great, and then uh, it just the thing is uh, with this addiction. So uh, just to back day a little bit and pull it back yeah, to his roots, uh, Danny was always kind of like the super responsible one. So there's three of us, uh, Jimmy, Danny, and myself. And are you, you're the youngest? I'm the youngest. Okay. And uh, Jimmy and I are the crazy ones. You know, like yeah. if anybody was going to get in trouble, it was going to be us. You right. Know? Danny was like super responsible and just intelligent and like, you know, daddy's boy. Yeah. Uh, but what happened to him, unfortunately, was uh, it was prescribed to him. So he got in. A uh, four-wheeler accident back in 2008 and he was up in Bridgewater and he drove off a cliff and he had shattered his entire shoulder Wow, so when he originally came out of it and like made it to the hospital They were thinking that he could be partially paralyzed because it looked that bad. Wow. So over That's time serious. Yeah, he started to come back from it. He had surgery to reconstruct his entire shoulder uh, And when he went home, he went home with a prescription for oxys Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, right around that time frame, my uncle, had, who was close to us, passed away. Two weeks later, Danny got in the four-wheeler accident. And then while he was recovering from surgery and on the oxys, my father passed away unexpectedly. Yeah. So he was going through a lot of emotional trauma right. at that point, which, uh, in my opinion, the majority of the people that are struggling with addiction, everybody looks at that as their main diagnosis and the thing that needs to be treated but usually there's a lot of underlying uh mental or emotional right issues that are probably uh compounding it and that's pri primarily what needs to be looked at first but um right. so yeah so he was just in a bad way emotionally and uh he they undid his script for oxys uh a couple months after my dad passed away and so he just started um you know, with little things like, you know, it, it was always a pain management thing for him because the issue is, is that they're prescribing these opioids that for the moment are making you feel fantastic. Exactly. They, dumb, they dull your senses. They kind of numb you to the all those issues that you were just talking about. Yeah. And it, it, it doesn't only take the edge off of the pain, but like you were just saying, it takes the edge off of the emotional and the mental end of things as well. Yep. Uh, and it just numbs you out. But the other thing that it does is... Uh, as it ups your tolerance for the drug itself, it lowers your body's pain threshold. Right. So because you're now medicating your pain away all the time where you or I would stub our toe and say, oh, shit, you know, and, yeah. and it hurts and it sucks yeah. for a couple yeah. minutes. Uh, they can't handle pain. Their brain has their brain chemistry has changed and their tolerance for pain has gone down substantially. So where before he could handle it. Uh, now all of a sudden his shoulder was incredibly achy and it's no longer a pain that he can tolerate. Yeah. He doesn't have a script anymore. So he started with little things like buying hydros and it was just to take the pain away. Right. And it, and once they take that script away, now you're looking for illegal avenues and trying to get them out of people's cabinets and things like that, yeah. turning to the wrong methods and yep. means to try and uh, get rid of that pain again, both emotionally and physically. Yeah. So then for him, it was kind of a natural progression uh basically like i was saying before uh if you don't have a whole ton of experience or have looked into opioids your tolerance builds to them so you just need more and more and more and more so he was you know it went from hydros to perks to you know oxys the next time, strongest and thing then opanas time. which i don't know much about but that's basically when he told me he turned to heroin because the opanas were so insanely expensive that he like 
couldn't afford the rest of his life and he made good money so right, like right. he was uh, sending himself broke with the opanas so i guess a buddy said to him like why don't you try here's the cheaper street alternative dope. it feels the same way if not better and it's the cost of a dime bag of weed right so crazy uh, that's when he started doing heroin and that was uh, nine and a half years before he passed away. It's crazy. And, and, you know, going back to, like you said, the pain tolerance and all that, and you're looking for these different avenues. It's very similar to, like, college kids, you know. Uh, somebody who needs Adderall or Ritalin or something, it'll dull you out. But if you don't need it, your body's already just normally there. Yeah. It's just taking you to the next level. And that's when people start to abuse it. You're really exceeding what your normal capabilities are, or so you think, you know. Yeah. And so where you're like, oh, man, I can't really even function with this pain. Oh, now I can become Superman feeling, you know, feel a little bit better throughout my day even though in the long term you're going to be feeling worse because as soon as that goes away it's dragging you right back down and into the, into the depths yeah and opioid withdrawals specifically are brutal of course brutal. yeah so i've seen him go through withdrawals a few times and it was like the worst flu you could imagine and and the really twisted part of it is that the thing that's making you sick on a daily basis is now the only thing that can make you feel better right you know, so he would go through these things where he would know he needed to get clean. This was before it really got out of control. Right. And so he would try to get off of them and he'd be shaking, sweating, throwing up, just terribly ill. Yeah. Uh, and then you'd always know when he went back to it because he'd go from, you know, super flu like to happy Superman. Happy. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah. And I think the other thing is, and, and if you look like you were looking statistically and you gave us some stuff over the last couple of years, but if you were to look at the serious spike in the last like absolutely. 10 years. Absolutely. Um, you know, when opioids specifically, uh, you know, if we look back to the 90s, early 2000s, uh, the more affluent communities, unfortunately, really only pay attention to the things that are impacting them. Right. And the things that are going on in the poor man's community don't get a lot of attention. So heroin was always considered a poor man's drug. Right. So nobody was paying attention. But then, you know, pain management boomed. Big Pharma boomed. And they started sending out all of these prescriptions and, you know, people were feeling great and they thought this was going to be the cure to everything. But right. there wasn't enough long term research mm -hmm. for these people to realize what was going to happen to them. And then not only that, I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of people in the poor man's community that don't even really have access to that health care. So I feel like that's when it kind of permeated the, uh, the more affluent communities. And that's when people really started to pay attention to opioids and the numbers went through the roof. Absolutely. And it's like, it starts almost this vicious, vicious cycle where you're seeing people thinking that it's an okay alternative. Like, oh, I have pain, but the doctor gave me this. It's yeah. okay. Um, and that's one of the things that's obviously an issue in society today is the, the prescription regiments and stuff like that especially like you said opioids and benzodiazepines and things like that that are supposed to help dull the pain or dull the senses or uh, help you get by for whatever ails you you know or whatever you say ails you honestly because right. we know uh, plenty of stories where people are just kind of falsifying their situation in order to get those avenues but as you're seeing people with uh inaccessible health care inaccessible means of getting these things once you give them a taste it's hard to just say all right now go deal with your pain some other way go figure it out they're obviously going to be looking to anybody's alternative and, you know, and somebody in a desperate situation will turn to anything yeah. you know whether it's if you're hungry you're gonna eat out of the trash if you're uh you know freezing cold you'll go under a bridge overpass or you'll go anywhere and try to find warmth yeah. and it's the same thing when it comes to pain management and just kind of getting uh reholding your life you know re reconstructing a stable mindset for yourself and if that's the only means that you think you can do it and you can't pay for the expensive ones obviously you're going to you know whatever tom nick or joe down the street is selling you yeah. know what i mean and that's kind of what happened so like i had said he had gotten sober at one point for like three years uh so he kind of hit rock bottom and the only time he ever really got clean is if it was legally mandated you know because like he's not doing it for himself right he'd get in trouble he'd be he'd go to jail and then he'd be on drug court which was a pain in the ass but always a blessing right and whenever he got in trouble everybody else would be like oh no and i'd be like this is hope you know like right. it sucks but this is going to be the thing that'll help him at least for right. a little while and so. hopefully help him see yeah. That he can do better, you know. And they're trying to, so I recently, oh, well, not recently, uh, after Danny passed away, so a couple of years ago, did a four-part segment on WUTR uh, with Observer Dispatch, and it was called The State of Addiction. There was a town hall at the end, so they're basically looking for a reform in Oneida County. Oh, that's tremendous. So, yeah, so uh, I'll get where, more. Where can that be that. found again? I'm sorry. Uh, I can send you some links for That'd that. That'd be great. We'll put that up for everybody who wants to see yep. it. Uh, so I did that, and I'll, uh, you know, speak more to that in a little bit, but... 
Uh, so my point with that was uh, before they had started to look in, because this is all so new, it, it being so mainstream. I mean, drug abuse has always been an issue, but as we said before, it's always the poor man's issue. So exactly. nobody was paying attention. But when they were sending the scripts to the stay at home mom and to the dad, and now they're 17 year olds addicted and it's right. And it was getting them out of the cabinets and stuff like that. And they yeah. trusted the doctor. Right. And nobody, it's very rare that you question your doctor when you're feeling like shit and, and you just need something to help you. Yeah. You look to them, you trust them. Right. You'll go get the script. Oh, Clint and Maya, whatever doc says, whatever, you know, yeah. you're, you're looking at these things you're like i don't know what it is but i assume it's supposed to be for the betterment yeah. of, of myself so you trust them without doing your own research which we all need to do our own research this is just do your research it's yeah a, it's a little bit know what you're putting into yourself a lesson for yourself you know what i mean just do your research for yourself because had people really done uh, looked into it at all uh, opioids are never going to sound like a good option if you actually know which now people are coming around to and uh through that town hall i actually discovered that they are changing the way they're prescribing things so most people that are on it long term now have to see a doctor awesome. depending on their issues every 30 days or every 90 days, they can't just keep refilling their scripts. They got to keep coming in, checking up. You know what I mean? They're trying yeah. to to make sure that they're keeping in check. And kind of mitigate those uh, transitional periods where people go from the legal to the illegal drugs. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, legal and illegal, obviously just being terms here, because anybody who is abusing uh, an over-the-counter medication right. is obviously, uh, you can use it illegally. So right. yeah. So then uh, to come to bring it full circle to what we were saying before was that he was prescribed it and and before these systems had changed you know uh, when somebody came into rehab the first thing that they did well they don't want them to feel the pain of you know withdrawals because it's awful right so danny for example went in and they gave him uh medicine for sleep medicine for pain which was tramadol and at that time they kept telling all of us that tramadol was a non-addictive opioid like because it affected the same sensors but pain management pill right come to find out shortly after danny passed away and i started looking into things uh that all the testing on tramadol was done tramadol via injection so long term tramadol didn't look like it was going to be as addictive as a normal opioid would be right but something when they compacted it into a pill and put it out there made it a more addictive substance than what they were really wow uh like expecting it to be but uh anyhow so he was on tramadol for pain something for sleep something for anxiety you know they're they're trying to make him feel better but they're just keeping him legally high yeah exactly so at no point has he really bottomed out at no point has he actually been sober right they're giving him all of these things and the system when you come through you get in trouble go to jail drug court they give you insurance mm -hmm. even if you're not working like medicaid to get you through so they gave him all this wonderful things that were making him feel great he was functioning and then the insurance cuts off because they're not going to pay for it forever right and so now he's sober yesterday he had a script yesterday he had four scripts right today he has none and it's not like a gradual it's almost just like they're they're hopscotching him down these stairs like illegal drug to boom whatever we give you to boom get off it yeah and that can't be the way they didn't taper it for exactly. him i think they tapered the suboxone but the other stuff that they didn't uh so all of these things, you know, he was always promised that there wasn't going to be a withdrawal. You know, you're fine. Tramadol, right. there's no withdrawals. Right. There's no, it's not a non-habit forming. He went through terrible withdrawals. They were almost just as bad as when he was getting off a of dope. Um, so he started using again pretty much almost immediately. Yeah. Because he got off drug court, lost the insurance, and then got off probation like a couple weeks later. Yeah. And it just kind of for him... Uh, you know, it was like stepping down. Like it started with he was going to have a couple drinks with us. Right. And we were excited, you know, like he's off drug court. We'll have a couple drinks. That was right. never his drug of choice. So we were yeah. like, it'll be fine. But then it's drink with, you know, a couple beers. Now it's Jaeger. Yep. Now and I, I remember Danny joy. coming off at this point and, yeah. you know, you're so happy for his progress and mm -hmm. he was so happy with himself and just, worked, you know, tinkering on his confident motorcycle and, and, and just doing things that he loved to do. And yeah, confident again. And then again, you do see this kind of, uh, gradual decline again toward you start seeing these shadows of his former self almost yeah and so again you uh, as a sister as a loved one as a friend uh, you hope that they're not going to fall back into that cycle when did you realize it was kind of transitioning back into it so uh, danny lived with me mm -hmm. uh so i actually when i had my daughter she's uh eight now i'm gonna be eight soon uh I was a single mom. I lived alone and he was living in a homeless shelter. Nobody would take him in after he got in trouble because mm -hmm. it just was 
nobody nobody wanted the responsibility right you know because it had gotten bad he was stealing things and right. it just wasn't himself uh but i wasn't having that <laughs> so yeah. i called him up i said listen it, you could live in a homeless shelter and that's okay or you can come and stay with me and you're going to help with the baby yeah so it's kind of like yeah you know so him and my daughter are insanely close we used to junk uh, like joke around that she he was like uncle dada <laughs> obviously not a good joke it's kind of gross but. <laughs> but so yeah i took him i he was in rehab like 40 hours a week so i would drive him to rehab in the morning pick him up in the afternoon he would watch the baby while i had to do things so i kept a really close eye on him and yeah. we were really close and give him structure yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And then he had his own son. His son's a year younger than my daughter, mm -hmm. uh, and that was when he like really was at his best. You know, yeah. super, super happy. Um, but yeah, so as I was saying, when he got off of probation, it was like a beer, Jaeger, a joint, a hydro because he doesn't feel good, and it just kind of yeah. So I knew, I'm a no bullshit person. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew. I knew pretty much right away. Danny had these like crazy blue eyes. And when you do opioids, your, you know, your pupils are like pinpoints. Pin yep. And his uh, gorgeous eyes, but they would look like an ocean with nothing in them. Yeah. And that's when I always knew. And, you know, he would be, Danny wasn't the nicest person when he was sober. So he would come <laughs> in and be like, what's up? And like want to hang out. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so I was kind of hoping it was just going to like, it wasn't going to get out of control. I knew it was starting and I tried to talk to him about it, but he was super defensive. Uh, and I was just kind of hoping that it wouldn't get out of control again because yeah. he had, uh, for lack of a better term, he had life by the balls at this point. Right. He like, yeah. had a son that he loved, he had a girlfriend that he loved. Uh, he, the house, uh, it was just a perfect situation. Right. And you feel like you've done a lot and you've given him these, these foundations and yeah. like maybe you can shy, like, you know, turn your back once in a while. And yeah. then before you know it, uh, you're starting to see the warning signs again. Yeah. And he was like, you know, he had outside looking in this life that a lot of people would want. He had like taking care of the challenger and the Trans Am. He had his own right. Harley and the four wheelers and the, you know, like he just had a great life. Right. So even when I saw him slip up a little bit. You tried to give him the benefit of the doubt kind of thing? I kind of was like, don't be an idiot. Yeah. Like, you got it so good right now. I know. And I kept telling myself, how could he not be happy? He'll be okay. He's, right. Everything's great right now. Right. But that's just not how, you know, when you get addicted to a substance, especially uh, opioids, it forever alters your brain chemistry. Absolutely. You don't think the same way that you used to, and you never will again. You're always addicted. Right. It's kind of like an echo in the back of your head, no matter how good it's going. You're like, man, what if this was still in my life? You and know? I will say, like, the one true love of his life, and it sounds awful, but it was heroin. Yeah. Like, him and I would sit and talk even when he was sober, and the way uh, a lovesick puppy would talk about his girlfriend was the way Danny talked about heroin. Yeah. And just in this, like, and he wasn't a super, like, vulnerable, open guy, but when he talked, you could just tell that he loved it. Like, he was absorbing that time in his life a little bit differently than other yeah, things. Yeah, because I think it was the first time in a long time he just felt okay. Like a release. Yeah, because yeah. when he first started doing it, it really made him into, like, Superman. Right. Like, he would shoot up, and he would come upstairs, and he would start cleaning the house, and he's hanging out, and right. he's outgoing. Uh and then eventually you do more and more and more and right. he'd be nodding off. He would burn himself with cigarettes all the time. Yep. He almost hit a school bus. He was driving one morning and he nodded out uh, and drove in front of a school bus, almost hit him and totaled his truck completely. Wow. He went to jail for that. Just like with that, those drugs specifically, it just goes from like, yeah, you know, like it's you're sailing, you're good. You know, everybody thinks they're having a good time and it drops. And, and you, you could, never know if you're going to be the person because it's all based off of your brain. Chemistry. Exactly. And and it tricks you into thinking you're OK even when you're not. And so that's yeah. that's why it's so hard to get through to people like that. And people can share these similarities with, uh, you know, like alcoholics and stuff. And I've had alcoholics in my family and yeah, I've had too. family members and stuff plagued by um, different addictions and various things like that. And you start seeing them. It's like to begin with, you're seeing them act one way. You know, somebody who starts drinking initially, maybe they're Mr. Out there, fun loving, yeah. happy go lucky suddenly uh they're doing a little more often they're getting a little more aggressive they're it's it's more of a crutch in their life and so they're using it not as like a release like a party thing but as like a a, a, a stable something they need to be stable you know and and kind of solidify their life and even get them through the day and so 
uh, it's just kind of crazy to see this transition in somebody, especially someone you love. You and know, it happens quickly, uh, very it's quickly, a very slippery slope, especially if they've been there before. Um, so yeah, it basically got to the point where he was taking his son and was even like nodding out when he had him. He lived with me, so like I always had the baby; he was fine. Mm -hmm. But I had to reach out. That was like when I knew it was bad. Yeah. I had to reach out to my nephew's mother, my brother, and I did my other brother, and was like, just so you know he's definitely using heroin again. And like, I don't want to say that. It's a big fight between him and I. He won't admit right, it. Right. Uh, so then I kind of, I told her and then I kind of went on this like crazy bender to get him in trouble because I knew that it was the only thing that was going to make him better. Uh, so the, the thing that's hard with loving somebody or caring about somebody that's addicted to something is that it's insanely difficult to get them help unless either it's legally mandated or they're willing to do it. Right. Uh, and he wasn't willing. You can't drag him in there and say, lay in this bed and go through withdrawals and yeah, get over and it. Yeah, and they won't keep him. Like if you try to bring him to the Addiction Crisis Center, for example, uh, or the Beacon Center, or wherever, they legally cannot keep them right. unless they're willing to stay. And yeah. even if they're willing to sign up, they can still walk out at any time. So it's just like this hopeless go around. So I kind of went on this bender where I was like, desperate to get him in trouble because i knew it was the right. only thing i was gonna say right. that sounds so shitty but... i know but you cared for him in this situation yeah. and i think a lot of people when they're presented with this issue or they have somebody close in their life that is going through this they te i see more people than not talk about a situation and they are just a bipartisan to it they're just uh you know he's going through this uh my cousin is you know got a real bad heroin addiction and so i haven't seen him in a while well that's not the answer we need people confronting them the way you mm -hmm. did and you need to be able to call people on their shit yeah. And if not, they will always go through thinking it's okay or they'll just barely get by or they're going to hurt themselves or others, you know, similar yeah. to this situation. And you love them, you care for them so much. You have to be able to identify these warning signs and do what's best for them, whether or not they think it is, because honestly, they're not thinking straight. Yeah. They don't ha they have the chemical imbalance in their head that's telling them it's okay and it's not okay. And they need the thing that's killing them. Exactly. So it's not even them thinking like, oh, screw you, I'm going to do what I want. They need it yeah. or they're going to feel like their world is coming undone and yeah. like they're sick. Uh, so yeah, actually, t and to your point, and I, you know, I've become a big advocate for all of this. I talk to people on a regular basis after I did the news, uh, segments, I had people reach out to me that I don't know, telling me that they're an addict, that their mother was an addict, that their child's an addict, just like telling me their whole life stories and yeah. even people reaching out to me, asking for advice on how to talk to children. Because the other issue with Danny is that not only did he have his own son, I have children. Jimmy has a son. Right. So, you know, we had to maneuver delivering a difficult message to four very small children that yeah. really weren't ready to hear it. Um, so, yeah. But my point that I was trying to make is that what you were saying, you know, your cousin has a bad addiction and you kind of back off. Yeah. Nothing I can do about it. They don't want to help themselves. Yep, exactly. And I always tell people don't overextend yourself to the point where your own quality of life is now uh, not as good, you know is lower don't do that but when my brother passed away he was uh, surrounded by people in a room 10 you know probably 10 people who were his best friends growing up that kind of all had for their own self-care i'm not saying anything bad but had kind of all backed off right and then they have this moment like this wave of regret like what if i had done something I should have done more. Yeah. I should have been there for him because Danny's biggest issue, and I think this is actually how I became uh, more public about things. I was always uh, never afraid to confront Danny face to face, but we never made his addiction super public. The people, a lot of people knew, mm -hmm. but I wasn't like going out there and speaking to it on social media and like trying to gain a following or anything like that. Right. So uh, when he passed away, like 24 hours before he passed away, I just kind of made an executive decision that like you might come out of this and you might be mad at me and you might be embarrassed but like this is step one i'm i'm gonna talk about it bringing now. attention to yeah. it yeah so my first status was when he was sick and i just basically the thing is is again like we were saying if it's if things aren't happening prevalently <clears throat> in the affluent communities nobody cares right white noise you know right. Uh, so my first status was basically saying that heroin doesn't discriminate and it doesn't care if you're black, white, rich, poor, young, old, like none of us are immune to this. Right. So like we need to start paying attention because nobody ever just like wakes up when they're 17 and is like, yeah, I want to try to stick a needle in my arm today. Right. It yeah. doesn't start like that. It yeah. starts with us going out to a party, having it's a good time and trying something. And you just happen to be that one person that your brain chemistry isn't 
right and it sticks with you so hard yeah. and it's sad to see that we have a society that's so taboo against these things where you see somebody who's sick with cancer and it's post all about it oh we need to fight cancer yeah. but heroin it's like i don't really want to post about like a you know just for lack of a better example my cousin my brother whatever being a heroin addict because it looks bad on me well no it doesn't because it's an issue and you know i wanted to say uh, i was looking up some information on the john hopkins university and they don't look at it as an addiction. They don't call it that. John Hopkins themselves call it an opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. It's something innate in you that is now broken and it needs to be healed. And without the support of loved ones, without avenues to look to, if you feel like everybody's just shutting you out or you're just, um, you, know, you know, like you have to be this, uh, what am I saying? Like, like, a like an outcast to your whole family and to your whole mm -hmm. life. If you feel like you're just somebody who, uh, I'm not going to contact them or because they're not going to help me they're not going to think of me the same way i don't want them to look at me like this then nobody's ever going to get help and so i think like you said the first aspect the first start that people need to make is bring light to it bring attention to yeah. the fact that this is going on and don't treat it taboo treat yeah. it like something that's seriously uh broken inside them and that you want to help repair yeah 100 percent. so then that's kind of where i went next was you know after he passed away i was quiet for a little while um but like this at this time wouldn't have been something that I would have been able to do, but just because that somebody like probing back, asking questions, having the discussion face to face was really uncomfortable for right. me. So social media be kind of became an outlet because I could really think through what I was trying to convey, yeah. how I wanted to say it, because it's highly emotional. You yeah, know? of course. So my next thing was ending the stigma. So I posted a couple statuses about that and the majority of them were just going off on the person that he was before. Great kid, you know, yeah. great student. Um, so that's what WUTR actually caught on to first. They saw that uh, status about, you know, ending the stigma. And they reached out and asked if they could use that. And I was like, yeah, sure, you know. And they were like, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And I gave some more background. And they were like, oh, would you mind if we came to your home and, like, interviewed you for the news? And I was like, yeah. I was a little apprehensive. Right. But, like, kind of the moment that he passed away, I just made a decision that, uh, you know, I've seen so many people and known so many people that have lost uh, their lives to this or have struggled with this and nobody ever wants to talk about it because it's an uncomfortable situation. Right. So in his eulogy, I made sure that I put in there that it was so I wrote and delivered his eulogy. There was a lot of stuff about addiction in it. Uh, in his obituary, I wrote that as well. For the, and I made sure that they said, you know, people say like passed away unexpectedly and they don't give a lot of information. Right. You guys need to hear it. it it's not embarrassing. And, and it doesn't make you less of a person. We need to uh, people that are on uh, that are suffering from substance abuse are oftentimes dehumanized. Yeah. And and when you dehumanize someone, exactly. it makes it that much easier. Exactly. For you to right. Brush it to the you, side. They, you look people. And I hate that. People look at people with addictions as subpar. And, you know, when I was in uh, Alfred State getting my associate's degree, I was working for Oasis, uh, the Oneida, uh, or the uh, Oneida Alcoholism Substance Abuse Services. I, I forget the whole acronym. But uh, you see these guys, and I'm working with these guys in a halfway house that are, you know, walking to their appointments, going to their meetings, and they feel lesser because they have to do this. Oh, you know, man, I, I wish you guys – didn't have to make me walk to my appointments. I just feel like everybody looks at me a certain way and they feel like dehumanized. They feel lesser than, and that's not the case. We need to be able to let these people know, like we care about you. We know you're equal to us. That's why we want to bring you back into full functioning society with us. You know, it, it, it just kind of makes me sick to see how, like you said, a, a lot of the upper class, a lot of people with more um, affluence, they, they shine away from these things. They look down on these people with these issues and it's, I think that's one of the leading causes of people hiding it, why people are so good at, you know, concealing some of these warning signs, why it progresses so quickly. And it's a very much a compounding issue that if, again, circling back to the same idea, if we're, if we're not bringing light to it, it's going to stay in the dark. And that's how we lose people that we yeah, love. hundred percent. You know, and that's why I got out of control so quickly. Yeah. It just in the last like 10 years, it just skyrocketed because for the longest time, it just wasn't anything that anybody wanted to talk about because it, they feel shame brought on to their families or, uh, or they don't want to embarrass the person. And it's it's not embarrassing. It's absolutely. a disease. Like you said, it's a disorder and it needs to be talked about because it could literally hit any of us. Me and Jimmy and Danny were raised in the same household, went through the same stuff. Right. You know, and I'm not saying that it was easy, but we all turned out completely, totally differently. Yeah. And I 
when I was young, partied just as hard as he did. Yeah. It could have been me. Right. Like, they very easily could have been. It, it can happen anyway. It should have been me because <laughs> I was the bad one. <laughs> but my brain chemistry was different than his. Yeah. And that's really what it comes down to. And that's why you'll see, you know, I knew somebody recently who lost, uh, they were, uh, I forget which school they went to. It was my cousin's friends, but they were in school to be doctors, this group of friends, and three of them overdosed within a week of each other. And wow. they'd come from like, good families they're going to school to, to get a medical degree they're going to be successful and it's even affecting them right so yeah ending the stigma for me is the biggest thing and i think it's what kind of held danny back too he was just he felt a lot of shame yeah i think uh, something too that we should mention is that uh we're not discussing this in the light of like danny you know was was plagued by this total illness we're, we're trying to say that he was such a good guy that it breaks our hearts to have to see that this happened to him yeah you know and we're celebrating the fact that his life was as good as it was and he had such an impact on us that we want to be able to talk and prevent this from happening to other people and i think that's what people need to do if you're in a situation where you're kind of worried about these kinds of things you need to be able to open up to loved ones to friends to family and say man uh, this is the guy i once knew or the girl that i once knew and this is I, I just see that they're not the same. And what can I do about it? Where can I go? Yeah. You know, and, and it starts with having an open discussion and recognizing it and just saying it out loud. One of the things they teach you in like psych classes and things, it's like when people verbalize things, it brings you're hearing what you're saying. And sometimes that really brings it to light for you. Yeah, you're like 100%. when you start when you're like, ah, oh, you know, he's been sketchy. He's been alluding to me. I think he stole some money from me. You got to say out loud, is he on heroin? Is he on a drug? Is he on pills? What's going on? There's it's some facing an uncomfortable situation. Exactly. Right on. You can't ignore it just because it's uncomfortable. I agree with that. And people need to be able to take that step. And I think that's a big one. Um, there's a lot of good things that we're bringing into this conversation that if people were uncertain about, um, you can always reach out to either Candace or I, and we can talk about this openly, but that's what needs to happen. We need to make this a prevalent part of our society an open communication uh and things that you can't just again going back to saying like you can't just step to the side and hope they get better but somebody in this mindset will never just go get themselves help to. they need help it. us they yeah. need the people that love them to help and there's also support groups for so i think it's tuesday nights i haven't been in a while because it just isn't something that i personally need anymore but there is support groups i think at the insight house on tuesday nights for family members and loved ones of people who are addicted to drugs and the addict themselves it doesn't need to be a part of the inside house. They mm -hmm. they don't need to be there with you. Mm -hmm. It's just a support group that you can go to to become informed and to, to find your little tribe right. to help you get through it. Uh, and that was a major thing for me that I just thought was incredible that I didn't realize until after he passed away that I, I would just have to say that as much as it was like this a stigmatized negative thing a couple of years ago, people are going to great lengths to try to do what we're doing now. So there's that support group at Insight House. And then also, I don't know if you saw it, but Sesame Street just did an episode. I didn't, but I did hear about it. I, I shared I it. I'll it. send it to you. Okay. But it was, I cried and I'm not like really? a super emotional person. And the little girl uh, came on and her mother was uh, battling substance abuse and it just told her story about how she has to go to meetings, how her mom has to go to meetings, how things have changed in her home and wow. like just the way they set up the episode was incredible. Wow. They nailed it. But like more importantly, they just did it. Right. You don't have to do it perfect. You just have to be willing to do it. Exactly. Have the discussion because it's affecting so many more people than you realize and that's a testament to where we're going in society i hope and i think it's on the upswing when you're seeing a show that's normally on public cable you know yeah, pbs or something a kid's show <laughs> yeah. it's it's you need to reach them at a young age because a lot of kids going out into the world who maybe are uh, sheltered at home or live in a small community tight-knit community they start going out experiencing the real world at college or whatever um or have injuries or whatever it may be that kind of transitions them into a situation where they try these things if they don't know how to handle it or what they're even doing it's it's going to hit them all the more mm -hmm. quickly and they, they'll succumb to it without even realizing it yeah i have small children and my son not so much because he's five but my daughter's going to be eight in december and if you ask her you know what substance abuse is what addiction is what drugs are you yeah. know and she even knows down to heroin and i really struggled with that because right uh, i grew up in a family with a lot of death not from drugs or anything but just you know, one of those families. So I saw a lot at a really young age. And sometimes I wondered if that had a negative impact on me. But I think it was more the way it was handled. Right. By the adults. It was like half trying to shelter you, 
half go look at that dead body but we're not going to talk about it you know uh so i didn't bring them to the funeral or anything i actually waited like a week to tell all the kids but when i did i really was like what do i want to tell them and then i thought about it and i was like you know it seems far away but in 10 years somebody's gonna be like you want to smoke a joint yeah (laughs) right you want to have a beer you want to try this you want to try that uh, so I felt like it was so important to be honest with them about what really happened because even my daughter had noticed, you know, she kept asking me, why is uncle Danny so sick? Is he going to die? Is uncle Danny going to heaven? Because it, he just looked so ill. Right. And so I just, and that's of, how they're conceptualizing it at that age. Yeah. So I kind of made an executive decision for all the kids. Yeah. I'm like, you're going to know what it is yeah. because when somebody goes to pass you a joint, which doesn't sound like a big deal, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, just know that if it's more than that. Just I want you to understand that there's a big, heavy responsibility that comes with that. Right. And you're not going to know ahead of time if you're the person whose brain chemistry is going to be altered enough that right. they get addicted from the first try of something. I'm not saying weed, but I'm right, saying right. pills or, you know. So, yeah, I told them. So, uh, I mean, it's been embarrassing a couple of times when my daughter's going to Notre Dame at this point and walks in. And she's like, my uncle's a heroin addict. And she's five. I'm like, oh, God. Oh, boy. <laughs> so I'm like, I'll, I'll email like, you. I, I, I can explain. Wait, wait. wait. <laughs> yeah. But like, I think it's so important now because they've uh, handled it so well and come through this like incredibly difficult situation with just like uh, this maturity that I haven't seen from little kids. And I think uh, we're moving past what I consider kind of an antiquated style of handling this thing where every one of us had the dare program in fifth grade or something. Mm. And that's like maybe your first experience. But it's so cartoonish. You got a friggin lion with a T-shirt on. You're trying to explain cartoonized little drug pills you know and you're like all right you almost consider like a joke at that age but to bring it to the reality of the situation and obviously you'll have to determine as a parent at what age and what time you want to explain these things to your kids but you got to bring the reality of it to them and you got to say you know it's not just a drug you should say no to just say no no i mean you got to be like why heroin you're going to inject it into your veins then it's going to overcome you you're going to think you're great it's going to then make you sick you're going to want it and want it and want it until it kills you you know or or something something will lead to those situations Mm -hmm. and so i i think we're finally starting to like you said even just seeing on sesame street where young kids are watching it it, we're bringing it to their attention in a more serious way we realize that we can't just cartoonize and kind of fantasize this thing it's becoming a more serious situation and that's important and i think it's also important to again be able to recognize the warning signs and then make yourself open and available so like when you were going through this stuff uh, what were some of the warning signs that you saw and then what were the what were the transitions you had to make? Because obviously you had to move to being just a sister to a sister who cares and wants to help with this situation. Was that difficult for you? What were the things that you had to do? You know. Yeah. So uh, we come, unfortunately, from uh, a line of substance abuse. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, like my mom loved my brother or whatever, but like I wasn't just his sister. I was a lot more than that. Mm-hmm. And I was the one that was really pushing to try to like make shit happen, you know? Right. Uh, so yeah, it was difficult. I actually like started having really bad panic attacks because I couldn't sleep at night. I would, uh, you know, if you have kids, people who have kids, you go in to make sure your baby's breathing at night. I would go in to make sure he was breathing too, you know, because it was that serious and he overdosed four times before he passed away. So we had been down this road before. Um, so it's insanely difficult. And as far as warning signs go, uh, we, it got out of control because we didn't know. We came from people who who drank, but I didn't know about heroin or right. opioids or I, I didn't know what to look for. But uh, it, for me, primarily, it would be mood swings, seeing somebody go from uh, incredibly irritable and uncomfortable and almost look sickly like they want to crawl out of their own skin to, you know, they disappear into a room and come back. And, you know, 20 minutes later, half hour later, maybe not even, they're a whole new person and they're happy and So mood swings are a big thing for me. And I don't mean like today you're bitchy, tomorrow you're happy. I'm talking significant short period of time mood swings. Uh, The eyes will always tell it. Uh, Again, the pinhole pupils. mm -hmm. And And then uh, with heroin specifically is nodding off. So in the middle of a conversation, you know, it's falling asleep kind of. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of things to look for. And just like slip of personal hygiene, which kind of sounds gross. Right. But it's that that's a huge one. Uh, and just like lack of regard for their own well-being. They right. stop paying their bills. Uh, it's it just so many signs. Right. But I would say primarily those are the ones that are like 
big deal. And of course, obviously, you see them try to cut friends and family off, people that they feel might uh, chastise them for mm-hmm. it. They're going to try and stay away from. So uh, obviously, if you're seeing anybody kind of demonstrate these things, you might want to, again, bring that conversation up. Talk to somebody else that really cares about them. If it's your brother, talk to your mother about it or your father. If it's uh, you know a cousin, talk to their parents or, or whatever it may be. If you feel like you... and. and Humans have a good intuition. We're able to know when we're in danger, when uh, we should do certain things. Uh, you have a pretty good read on a family member if you're close to them or a friend, you know, mm-hmm. and you shouldn't be afraid to, you know, bring that up and, and start down an avenue is as bad as it might sound in your and in your head. You're probably thinking, man, if I open this door, there's no turning back, you know, especially if you start calling them on these things. Yeah. Uh, it's something that's going to be uncomfortable, but you have to do it not only for the greater good of them, but for the greater good of yourself and the mutual well-being of your family and just the whole situation. Yeah, and I think sometimes you worry about being over-accusatory or or dramatic because to you, you're like, you know, the thing with him is he always made us second-guess ourselves. Like, I would know. I would know. And then I would have one conversation with him and I'd be like, I'm an asshole. (laughs) I was wrong. Like, you know? So uh, the other thing that you have, you can't be afraid to... And and that was another status that I posted in a whole rant. That's what I do. But you can't be afraid to be the asshole you can't be afraid to have them upset with you because even if you're making uh an accusation that's maybe a little heavy and not quite as big as what you're thinking it is uh there's something going on you have to trust your intuition and even if you're a little bit dramatic even if you take it a little bit too far you've at least made them aware i see you right i know something's not good and i'm here for you and sometimes abrasion is what people need to really jostle them awake to the situation you know if you're always you know tippy-toeing around it like oh okay sweetie all right if you say so i'll believe you they're always going to just lie to you and they'll always try to make an excuse they'll always find a back door around the conversation and and find a way to continue doing this so it's important to shell shock them open that door and be like listen I think you're doing this, whatever it may be, and I want to get you help. And so let's talk about it. You know, don't feel like I'm closing you out. I'm opening up to you. you yeah. Know? And that's important. Yeah. And he uh, closed down, uh, like most do, mm-hmm. pretty hard when I started calling him on things. Like I said, I went a little crazy trying to get him in trouble. I would see him a little faded and go to drive to the point where the New Hartford police officers knew who I was yeah. or who I were. They, you know, they wouldn't be, they were like, Miss Malone, we, you know, we've told you we can't pull him over for no reason. Right. I'm like, he's falling asleep, standing him up. <laughs> Follow him for five minutes. Yeah, I'm like, he swears, I would call yeah. and I'd be like, this is Candace Malone. He's going to McDonald's. Which is five minutes from my house. I'm like, act now. You're like CIA. You're like, yeah, we got him. He's going down fourth. And, uh... Yeah, and I mean, I can laugh about it now just because I have to find the humor and everything. But, right. oh, crazy stuff. I went through his room every time he'd leave the house. And I'm like, I'm going to find your heroin. Which yeah. one time I did like it was like powder form of that spilled it so then i had a panic because i was like i'm gonna call the cops on you if i find your heroin you know i'm gonna get you in trouble you're gonna go to jail you're gonna get sober it's gonna be fine and uh so i spilled it and uh i think that's what it was he never really confirmed it because he's not gonna look at me and be like you spilled my dope when he's trying to tell me he's not doing dope uh so i I spoke to a police officer after that and he was like so what was your plan there you're just gonna call me up and be like i got a bag of heroin and i'm not gonna think He's like, do you want to get arrested? Right, like, right. You got to think more clearly than this. Yeah. Like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> so it was rough. Like I, I tried so many different things and it was rough. And I mean, eventually it didn't end up working out. And I'm not one of those people that will say confidently, everything happens for a reason because some stuff is just really messed up. Right. Uh, but I do truly believe that not everything happens for a reason, but you can find the light and a positive side in anything right so like this situation sucked for my nephew and my kids and for me and my mom and my brother uh but i have not saying that i'm super special but i have touched so many lives and i've had so many people touch mine just being like i trust you enough that i never talk to anybody and i want to tell you my whole story that's awesome and that's meant everything to me that's very powerful yeah and um I mean, it's obviously difficult, too, to be able to kind of prep yourself personally to be able to handle these things, you know, and uh, I think that's something that people have to work on uh, to even build up the courage to assess the situation. And maybe that's what some people are afraid of. And by having an avenue or somebody as an example, like, wow, if they can do it, maybe I can do it, too. I think that's strong and powerful, you know, and it kind of goes to the theme of this show and why I wanted you, you on so badly. It's because there are underlying themes. No, no one person in the world is that unique you know yeah. there's been billions of people before and there are billions of people on earth now 
uh, everybody's handled a situation that's similar to somebody else somewhere. Yeah. And so if you feel like you're alone or you don't know how to handle a situation, whether you're the one suffering f- you know, from the addiction and the disorder, uh, or if you're watching a loved one do it, you got to just be able to open your mind to finding these avenues and reach out. And if you see somebody who shares the situation, don't just hit the like button, communicate and be able to learn and and take and build yourself up to be able to handle your own situations. Yeah, 100%. And so, again, it's like these deep-seated, deep-rooted veins that run between us all. And that's what lost guidance is, you know. And and this interaction with uh, an opioid addiction in your family to someone you love so much has obviously shaped and molded your own personality and oh, yeah. what you were once so sheltered about and kind of introverted. Now you want to communicate and help people. Mm-hmm. And what a testament to how great it is that you can turn such a negative aspect into a positive one. You have to, otherwise you're not. I, I truly believe that if you can't, one, find the humor in some dark situations, yeah. and two, uh, be able to find the light in it. There's got to be, I, I mean, every situation, even if it's just like a minute thing, has something positive about it. And having lived a pretty tumultuous existence, yeah, uh, it would have it would have gotten me by now. I would have ended up like Danny right. had I not been able to tell myself that you have to be able to find right. just one positive thing, find the light in every situation. And that's when he passed away. I knew even when we went into the hospital, he was on life support for a couple of days. I walked in and knew right away. There's yeah. no way he's coming out of this, wow. you know. Uh, and I made a decision then, like, this is going to be what I do. It's yeah. the only thing I can do. I can right. help other people. And I can't help. I, not that I failed him, but I wasn't informed enough right. and confident enough to really be able to, like, drive home the things that I think would have helped him. And I just swore up and down that that's what I was going to do from this point going forward is try to help other people be informed enough to uh, stop dehumanizing, to end the stigma, to to arm yourself with support groups or even just someone like me. I've had people say that they would never go to a group, but they just want to talk to somebody that for some reason they feel connected to. Right. And that's been my mission since then. Yeah. I just want to be able to help other people now. And uh, one light that everybody can certainly look to, obviously, is the light at the end of the tunnel. When you start these conversations and you start that train rolling, you know that if you get them through this and you guys get through it together, you're going to be able to, to come out on the other side mm-hmm. a, a stronger knit unit and also just kind of obviously not going back to the way that you once were because things will never be the same because you, you've overcome this major hurdle. But to have them back as the person that you once remembered, yeah. somebody who's functioning and you could see smile without happy yeah you know happy without an assistance you know with any chemical assistance and so that's really important but i think also too and i wanted to speak on this a little bit is the importance of of maintaining your own stability maintaining a reliable and structured environment so that they feel like they have somewhere to go when it's all over and not that they're just getting thrown to the wolves and you're not just like gonna check them into rehab and then leave them there for 30 days or whatever um it's important to make sure that you have an open household you don't need to be chastising these people who are already so down that they're turning to this chemical they need to be able to feel like the love is there and they don't have to find it within themselves or within a drug so yeah danny actually was you know tatted all up Mm -hmm. he wasn't actually when he got sober the first time off of heroin he had like you know a couple little small tattoos here and there and I always make the joke and it's a little dark and I'm like, had to have some kind of needle, you know? <laughs> so he like got off of heroin and immediately went like crazy. And he was, he, Danny yeah, tattooed like neck down, neck down yeah. knuckles. Uh, but the one thing that he had that, you know, him and I had a little bit of a fight about, obviously, again, I was a little bit motherly towards him, uh, but he would give me his ideas ahead of time is what he's going to get. And I was like, no, absolutely <laughs> not. So we would fight about it. But he got um criminal tattooed huge across his stomach. And I was like, you're an idiot. Like, just <laughs> why? You know, and then he, right. he looked at me and at this point he'd been sober for a couple of years. And he said, you know, no matter how far I come, no matter how good I'm doing, no matter how long I've been clean or stayed out of trouble, everybody always looks at me as the criminal. They're just waiting for me to mess up again. Right. So it was like a big deal to to him. It was a way of, uh, you know, taking back the power. Right. You know, so he had that tattooed on this him. This is how you see me, then this is what I'll give you kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. He was like, that's fine. You can see me that way, but that's not who I am anymore. So to him, it was like taking back the right. power of the word criminal. And he also had relapse tattooed on him. And he was like, I'm never going to. At this point, he didn't think he was going to. But he's like, but that's what everybody's waiting for. And that's how they see me. He's like, so why don't I put on a good show? Right. You guys think what you want. I'm going to own my own sobriety, own my own success, yeah. and my own happiness. And that was when he was at his best. But yeah. 
Anybody who knows Danny too knows that he was comfortable in his own skin, and yeah. and you know he would he would have no problem telling you what's what or how he felt about something, and that was one of the things that I always admired about him so much. And, yeah. You know, on top of many other aspects. Yeah. But uh, I I like the way you worded that, just taking power in those words again, mm-hmm. in that the the labels that we give them, and, and it goes back to this taboo and the stigmatizing society. Yeah. That we have, it's like uh, you can't look at somebody and say. All right, you come through it. And we want you to come through this whole thing, right? We want you to get off of it. But then after it's done, we're just going to look at you with this tinged eye of saying, yeah. all right, but how long are you going to do this for? How yeah. long are you good? No, you got to say, all right, welcome back and let's keep it moving. You yeah, know? it's not even just family. It's community wise as well, which like I said, I could have talked to my family and, you know, talk their ears off about it. But that's why I want to get sort of a community outreach for it was because to him, it wasn't even just family. It was going to Riley's dairy to grab a soda, right. seeing the way people look at him because right. they knew in small town USA, everybody knows. Everything. I know it makes the OD and suddenly, yeah. And nobody ever thinks that it's going to be their kid. Right. And that was like my biggest thing. I was like, it can be. Yeah. And it will be maybe not your kid, but somebody you love. If you just don't start, like you said, knowing what the warning signs are and just knowing that you're not immune to this. Yeah. Nobody is. Right. Especially when it's being dealt out by your local MD. Mm-hmm. Nobody's immune to it. So you just have to be, uh, to, some, uh, uh, to some extent, prepared. Not overly prepared. Don't stress yourself out, but just know what it is. Know that it's a possibility. Know yeah. that you're not immune. And uh, come down off that high horse a little bit. Right. We're all human. And I think in this kind of middle class suburb area, especially in the central New York, Oneida County areas like that, a little more rural, a little more uh, suburban. But uh, you're seeing, again, going back to the families that kind of shelter their kids. And, you know, there's always been you go to school and you see these two kind of uh, totally differenti- differentiating parties. You have the lower class kind of families and the higher class mm-hmm. kind of families and those families that always shelter their kids and when they went out drinking it's punishment for a week groundings mm-hmm. for a month taking away the car rights and all that meanwhile those families are all looking down on these families because they assume those are going to be the problem children and stuff like that but you oftentimes see these kids who again haven't been given the experience or the knowledge or the expertise or the the proper tools to handle these situations again going off to college they jump right into a situation. They go to a party. Hey, dude, take one of these. What? It'll mm-hmm. make you feel great. Next day, you're like, man, that was pretty awesome. Let me try to get some more of those. You, you're so just willing to break out of your skin and feel this kind of freedom because you've been sheltered in this home life that you've had and you've just been kind of uh, ignorant to the fact because your parents never wanted to bring it up to you because, oh, our, our boy would never do that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I've seen that time and time again. So many uh, times. Personally, yeah. like people I know. Uh, and it's... It, like you said, it can happen to anybody. And so we need to remove the stigma. We need to open the lines of communication. All great things that we've been highlighting here uh, are avenues that anybody could take. And it's important that we open the, these things up and keep them in our minds so that it's kind of like um, it's like like going hunting when you are looking for a deer you won't see a deer all day you'll see one and then suddenly you see them everywhere. Yeah. It's like you got this image in your head and you have this kind of preset notion of what you're looking for and suddenly it doesn't seem so crazy or scary when it hits you same thing with drugs if you are aware of the warning signs if you're aware of the situations some of the things to look for when it finally hits you you're like oh this is what i'm looking for rather than like you said maybe you were caught off guard after the fact and you didn't have the confidence or the wherewithal to know what you were dealing with now you do you you armed yourself with those tools to say if this happens again or if somebody's in the situation here's what i know personally i've dealt with and, and how we can help yeah. And how to get them the help that they need. Yeah. And the other thing I like to remind people of is you'll have a lot of people that say, that's a choice. You know, addiction's a choice. Drug use right. is, it is in the beginning. We've, you know, not, we've all done it, but a lot of us have done it, have made the decision to, uh, even if it's just as simple as smoke a joint. Right. Smoke get a, cigar, a little fucked up. Beer, sniff <laughs> a line of Coke. Like we've all been young. We've done stuff. Uh, I know that I have, and I'm not ashamed of that. And that's why I say it's truly based off of brain chemistry. Danny and I did this. I did stupid terrible things when i was young right, right and it very easily could have been me i could have been the person that decided one time i'm oh i'm gonna try cocaine right. and the difference is is where uh you know i felt you know superman for a night felt like shit the next day and then it was over for me you right. know uh it made him feel alive right it made him feel like he was taking his first breath after being underwater for an extended period of just time. an unrivaled it was feeling. different to him because his brain chemistry and his mental health were different. And so I like to remind these, especially the older folks, uh, you know, middle age, you know, older than that, who will say, oh, you know, 
you know, they get up in arms about it. And that was a choice. And it's this. And I really have looked at so many of them and been like, have you never done a line of coke? Have you never smoked a joint? Have you never gotten way too drunk and made a stupid decision? Right. Most people can say, Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe they don't want to admit it. Let me think back to the 60s. Yeah. Patricia. Thank you. Okay. Uh, And and most of them will, you know, they won't answer, but you can see them in their heads going through it. And I say, okay, well, that's all he did. Right. But it ended up differently for him. Yep. And for a lot of other people, because to him, it was just, you know, taking something from the doctor and saying, okay, that's okay. And then taking something on the street and thinking it was going to be a one-time thing to make him feel better, just like a lot of people have done. That's no different than going and blacking out at Saturday yep. Thursday. It's, it, it's, it just affected him differently. And you don't know if your kid's going to be that person. You can't see inside. Some of us definitely have that addictive personality, that yeah. propensity inside of us to want to do those things. And it's not till you activate it and you awaken it one day that you're like holy shit this has been inside of my yeah, chest this whole time you know yeah and nobody wants to admit that they their child or their mother or their father could ever possibly have that living inside of them right everybody's got a little something yeah absolutely everybody's got a little something so you gotta end again i hate to keep saying it uh but end the stigma yeah absolutely it could be anyone and it could be about a lot of things not only just like a, a chemical disorder when we're talking about like an opioid disorder here but you know, if you're seeing somebody with a schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, you need to you need to recognize these things and just know that it's something that's innate in them mm-hmm. that they just need help with and not that you need to chastise them or, or call them like, uh, you know, think of them as a lesser person because yeah. of it. You just need to be able to say like, OK, let's what's going on? Let's figure this out together. kind yeah. of thing. And it's a really fine line to straddle when you're one of your loved ones or your friends or whatever is going through that because. You know, it starts out and you really want to be there for them. And again, it, it gets to the point where, and this is where I say the fine line is, maybe you're overextending it yourself. Maybe your quality of life is now uh, lower because of the fact that you're trying so hard to take care of them. You know, so I always tell everybody, like, your mental health comes first. Yeah. Your mental health comes first. Right. But your mental health isn't going to be good when that person's dead. And you know that had you just... Right. tried a little harder, said something. Even if like I've told everybody when they tell me like I'm done, I can't do it anymore. I got that way with Danny. I mm-hmm. backed off for a while. Uh, I say, that's fine. I understand. I would never encourage you to put yourself out there to the point where uh, you're no longer happy and it's having a significant impact on you negatively. But what I will say is before you go, make sure you tell that person everything you love about them and everything you miss about them, mm-hmm. which can sometimes be an awkward conversation. Write it in a letter Send it in a text, leave a voicemail, do yeah. it face to face, whatever you got to do. Uh, you need to remind that person that you're not just an addict mm-hmm. to me. That's not the person that I love. Who I love is this guy yeah, or this memory. Absolutely. Or, so if you need to back off, that's fine. Do your thing. But make sure you say everything that you need to say to that person before you do it or you will end up regretting it. Absolutely. And you just made a really good point is because a lot of people, uh, especially those listening, you might not feel like you have the strength to verbally confront somebody face to face. A lot of people feel stronger and more able to get out their exact emotions, similar to how you do in your Facebook status by writing, Mm -hmm. write a letter, write a text, do whatever you got to do and send it to them. It maybe won't have that personal effect uh, uh, that you would get from a verbal conversation. You won't see those emotions in them, but just to bring their attention to it and say, Hey, I love you. I want you to get through this. And again, what I miss about you and how we used to be and things like that. And, and if that's your avenue in which you feel more comfortable, it's a start and something, just get it yes, out there, bring it to their attention that you recognize the situation and you care and you want to help. And may, a lot of times they're not going to see how far they've gone down the mm-hmm. rabbit hole. And it's only when somebody's trying to pull them back out that maybe they can, come up for air yeah and a lot of times they feel judged they feel right. a lot of shame they feel lonely and again they've been dehumanized by so yeah. m- in so many different ways just to look at somebody and there's actually a song called somebody someone uh, and it's about homelessness and drug addiction and it's just reminding that person that like you're not who you are right now right you're somebody's mother a brother son father yeah. friend whatever you are you're something to somebody and i just think it's so important to even if you're going to back off do it you know protect your mental health but just make sure you get out there to try to humanize them again to to remind them i'm not angry at you all the time right i'm angry at you i mean get your actions but not and and i i'm fed up with it and and personally i I cannot continue to battle this with you because i'm I'm not getting anywhere and it's it's making my mental health 
uh, deteriorate, but you just have to remind that person before you go. Yeah. This is what I loved about you. This is what I miss about you. And the second you're able to become that person again, or the first step you take towards becoming that person again, I got you and I'll be there for you. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, as we start, you know, heading toward wrapping up and we've hit at a lot of great points. Um, again, we're obviously here to celebrate, uh, the life of somebody that you loved and lost and not to chastise or bring a negative affect to it, but to just bring it to light that this, this needs to be fixed. This is an issue that's been ongoing and getting ever more prevalent in our society. And without these kinds of conversations and without being just black and white about it, then we're never going to get anywhere with it. Again, like, like we said, we're seeing a spike, I believe from 2010 to 16, they said it was a a three times spike in the amount of opioid overdoses we're seeing in the United States per capita. That's tremendous, especially in the central New York areas. Again, the Niagara areas, Long Island, uh, spread out in kind of the bigger cities of New York state itself where, you know, we're from um it's it's more prevalent so that's a byproduct of us ignoring it for too long it was similar to the crack epidemic in the 90s until we really started talking about it and getting these people help nothing was happening it was just getting worse and worse and so it's going to take people standing up confronting their loved ones and, and giving them the tools the comfort the safety and environment that they need to get stronger and help themselves you know yeah. um i think it'd be good though do you have any fun stories or funny stories you want to share about danny and oh. end it on a bit of a light-hearted note danny 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 uh so many stories uh with danny but uh so you know i i always find the dark humor in everything so sometimes i'm like is it a light story i'm not <laughs> sure but uh yeah so i mean funny stories with danny there's a million. He was just this person that, like you were saying earlier, is never afraid ever to say whatever's coming out. Like if he thought yeah. you were dressed like an idiot, he'd tell you you were yeah, dressed like, like an, fucking idiot. an idiot. Yeah, like if it, like me as a sister, if I put on a little weight, he'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> and it was like uh, with the best of uh, intentions, you know. But he just like really didn't care. So I can't say I have any uh, specific story about Danny, but I've just got to say, if you knew him. You were lucky. He was a great guy. He like lit up a room and he was just, you know, a dumbass. And he was funny. And he could and tell he was, you everything you need to know about cars, motorcycles. Oh, yeah, he was a motorhead. He loved working on four wheelers and Harleys. And uh, we grew up with uh, classic cars. And uh, he just, he took a lot of pride in things. Uh, he was incredibly anal. If it was something that he liked and something that uh, was his, he took a lot of pride in it. So it always had to be spotless and it always had to be the best of the best of the best. Uh, he just was a hard worker. He was funny. He would have done literally anything for any, I mean, he literally helped me raise my daughter. Yeah. You know, he was just a great, he was a great person. Yeah. That's awesome. And it, it it speaks to the importance of why we needed to talk about this and why if you're out there having a similar situation or a loved one, that's kind of uh, succumbing to this, then you need to begin these steps or if you've already lost somebody um, do as Candace has done and advocate and open yourself up to others and be able to share those stories and help people prevent this from happening to their lives, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, obviously Danny will be greatly missed carried on throughout uh, our years. And uh, I just hope that going forward in this area and in society and in our country, especially that we can start to work toward removing the stigma, removing the taboo and opening these lines of communication. So again, I want to thank you for coming on. Of course, This has been an awesome conversation. If anybody has any questions or comments, please reach out. Um, you can stay tuned for more awesome lost guidance content to be coming up. Season two is going to hold a lot of great guests. Uh, I think later today I'll be recording another episode, actually, so it should be really fun. And uh, other than that, uh, I just hope you guys have a great day. Try not to get lost out there and just uh, be happy. Enjoy life. Enjoy your loved ones and do do what you got to do to uh, make sure that you don't lose them, you know. So, all right, guys, we'll see you around.